Welcome to HBD Chat. I am James Hansen, your host here at HBD International, uh, producers of Harrison's Bird Foods and, of course, Wild Wings Organic Wild Bird Seeds. We are here today again with our founder, proprietor, leader, Dr. Greg Harrison. And we were going to spend a little bit of time today talking about the early years in Dr. Harrison's life, specifically around uh, the farm that he grew up in, Iowa, and some of the things that have changed over time that we think are relevant issues that need to be tackled today. And I think we wanted to start with two pieces of art that you brought in. Right. First, a picture of this is the family farm that you grew up on. Yeah, this was, I didn't actually grow up there. I grew about six miles away oh. in a small town called Eldora. And this was a farm that my grandfather started in 1930. I think he built that barn or 20, whatever it says on the barn. And um, this was a gift from my uh, mentor's wife, Bill Teets. His wife, Betty, painted that for my graduation present from veterinary school. And then uh, we've got another piece that I painted after I graduated from college and went to uh, Florida. I started thinking back about what were those things that I fell in love with on the farm. And so that's what this picture is about. And basically, the, ma the major changes that occurred was they went from using that farm place where if you go back and look at that picture, you'll see a hen house, you'll see a garden, you'll see a place where they stored oats and a place where they stored corn, a place where they housed the cows like we see here. And the thing that tied that all together was straw. Mm -hmm. And straw was the modern wood chips, if you will. And that particular crop wasn't as valuable as the crops in the future, but they, they needed those to get the carbohydrates and everything into the animals, those oats. But um, it was, I just found it interesting that my grandfather in the little piece of land north of this was taking some of his cows and putting them in a feedlot. And that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody doing anything other than just raising a cow and butchering it. And he had found that if you put some things in that food for those animals, they would gain weight faster and be prime grade. That was the driving force for cattle in those days, still is. But his cattle were what we call multi-purpose. So here he is, one of my relatives or a hired man sitting in the barn milking the cow. But if you look at her feet, her feet are tied together with what are called hobbles. And the reason is she's a, she's a field cow. And she would go out in the grass and have her calf out there, and then they'd bring the calf in with her while they milked so she'd stay calm. But if, when he first touched her, she might try and kick the daylights out of him. So that's why that chain is on there. They're not the docile cows of today. They were both milk and meat, and most of the cows today are either meat or milk. And so we started to see the beginning in my grandfather's farm going from oats and corn and animals that were fed with farm products. Once in a while, they'd go get some chicken food maybe at the Perina store or something like that. But that all started to change as corn bores hit. And they were trying to figure out, we won't even have corn to feed if we don't get these insects under control. Right. So he was one of the first farmers to use DDT. I would stand down at the end of a row. The crop duster would come in and drop the DDT, and I'd run down 13 rows, and he'd come back. I'm sure I got a lot of that on me, and I'm sure that has a lot to do with some of the issues I think that pesticides have created in all of our lives. The other thing that was interesting that my grandfather did, somebody convinced him that this little calf down here is probably going to be kept if it's a girl. But if it's a boy, they're going to neuter it, take his testicles out, and use him as a, a food animal. But then they found if they injected that male calf, they still castrated him, but if they injected it with diethylstabesterol, they got fat really quick. So he was one of the first people that I know of that ever implanted cattle. And that was industry and farming technology telling the farmer how to do things to make more money. Right. What happened with those cattle that were injected with diethylstabesterol, as we now know, that was a major cause of birth defects in children, breast cancer in women, so it got pulled off the market. And that's the way a lot of agriculture things are happening today. 
they're trying to replace the old ways of doing things so they don't have to involve so much labor and get everything done in one place. They can also keep the public from seeing what's going on. My grandfather never had a problem with somebody coming in and going around his farm. Mm -hmm. But we heard yesterday that there was a, a person who tried to visit a, a farm to do a, a photo op on, uh, or a university to do a photo op on farming, and they wouldn't let her film on the <laughs> university. So yeah. why is that happening? They, they must know. Secrets and things they don't want people to see. So this was kind of like the incubator for what we call confinement animal feeding operations today, CAFOs. Yep. And CAFOs are um, a whole new subject we'll talk another time on. But the bottom line is packing animals into a very close space, stressing them out, feeding them the wrong kinds of diets, just the kind of diets that will make them put meat on as fast as possible and no other concerns. So that was the main message I wanted to get out about my farming background is that I realized things were changing. I didn't know the effects of them until 40 or 50 years later. And now I realize the education I got at veterinary school was good for the time, but it's far from what we need to know about the way we take care of animals, the way we take care of each other, the way we feed ourselves. And I think there are things that were going on when that straw got put down here and mm -hmm. that cow used it as her uh, defecation place, she urinated it. There was a big manure pile right outside yep. the door there. And that would, once a year, you'd load up a manure spreader and go out and spread it on the fields. That's just not done anymore. And the way someone like David Vetter, who we're going to spend more time talking about, dreaming of a Vetter world, he does it by putting the cows out in the pasture. You don't have to put the cows in a barn and straw and haul the manure out. Right. You Save a step. Cows put it on. So that, that was why that was important to me. So those, those crops, you said the hay was part of the oat production and some of the other grains. But those slowly went away as Especially soy became more prevalent. Yeah, it's very unusual now for a farmer that's great involved in producing pro products for animal foods to grow oats. They just don't do it anymore because yeah. the straw has no value, basically. Whereas, you know, corn and soy and all those things are not the ideal food to go, but that's where the money is right now. So that's why they do it. Soy production has taken over most of those grains? Yeah, soy yeah. and corn. And they got so carried away with corn, they had to figure out what else to do with it, so they make ethanol. Right. Right. Well, it's an interesting uh, painting. You did this one yourself? Yeah, I did that one myself. How long ago did you do that? I did that in, let's see, I graduated in 67, probably uh, 71, 70, 71 after so I came from So it was all still Hollywood. fresh? Memories were still fresh, right? Yeah. You take the milk and squirt it in a cow's mouth. That's what she's waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> Treat. <laughs> Good memories. Amazing. Yeah. So do you, we did talk a little bit about the other picture. You mentioned the, uh, the outlay of the farm, which has been replaced almost entirely by industrial farms out there now. Yeah, this particular farm was sold to one of my cousins after uh, my uncle and his family got out of the farming and they just brought a bulldozer. Yeah. It's, everything it's was flattened, gone of all the buildings. And that's pretty typical now. If you go from when last summer was the most shocking I've ever seen. We went to my wife's class reunion in Mason City, Iowa. And you could drive for five, six, seven minutes at 80 miles an hour, one field on your right and one field on your left, 10 miles long. No ditches, no bushes, no shrubbery. No birds, no pheasants, no quail, no place for animals to hide and reproduce and protect the farmland. You know, birds eat insects, insects eat each other. Mm -hmm. it, there's a system they're designed for a purpose, right. and we've just eliminated that. Yeah, that that's a symbiotic circle, right, of, of right. the wildlife and the soil and whatever it is you're growing on that land. Right. All needs to work together. We talked uh, yesterday a, a little bit about the um, spores and fungus that live in the soil, too. I was never really aware of that. That part is fascinating to me, um, where you mentioned that there are particular types of bacteria and spores that are critical to this kind of reproduction and, uh, and agriculture. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? We're just finding out the significance of that. Um, 
there are several people that I'd like to interview in the future, like Dr. Don Huber from the University of Purdue, I believe. Um, at any rate, Don is a veterinarian who's been working with the effects of pesticides, specifically glyphosate, on whatever he could find. And what he found was glyphosate originally was produced as an antibiotic. And an antibiotic means that it kills life. Mm -hmm. And what forms of life does it kill? Well, they thought it was going to be bacteria and maybe viruses. And they weren't really concerned about funguses. Turns out, in addition to uh, sequestering, I think it's manganese or magnesium, probably magnesium, in the soil, that's why the plant can't grow. Mm -hmm. is if it's an herbicide that kills weeds, then that weed needs that magnesium to grow and the glyphosate ties it up. If you do a GMO product, you put the genes in the GMO product that's resistant to Roundup. It doesn't kill the things in that plant. So it can continue to grow with, while the weeds are dead. <clears throat> but the side effects of that glyphosate are now up to billions of pounds of glyphosate a year. You might be watching TV and see an ad that says, have you got malignant lymphoma? Right. Exposure and you need to, to send us your name and address and we'll make you a millionaire for dying of cancer because you were exposed to Roundup. That's sort of like what happened with cigarettes. They denied it, they denied it, they denied it, then they gave a few people some money, then put a warning on the package and here we are. And that's probably what's gonna happen with the pesticides. They're, they all know that they're harmful, but they're not going to give up the profit that they see with that. The mm -hmm. system is broken that they're putting it into, but there's still so much profit they just can't walk away from it. Yeah, it's too lucrative of a business. Yeah, they're 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 producing the the seed, the GMO mm -hmm. seed. They're producing the glyphosate. They're producing herbicides that can go in with it, and then those GMO things. One of the most popular one is called uh, neonicotide mm -hmm. and that was the one they added to stop the corn borer that was the final thing that stopped the corn borer was that plant produced a nicotinamide which is is a pesticide that kills bugs and it killed the corn borer well it also killed the honeybees yeah so now we're learning from our friends that are working with mushrooms that they can save those honeybees lives but it's only temporary you, mm -hmm. you might give them this secret formula that this gentleman's developed to protect the bees, but when he stops it, whenever that is, is it still glyphosate and nicotinamides and all these things in the environment? I mean, our bird populations are plummeting around the mm -hmm. world. We have 40 to 50 percent reduction in birds in the United States, and that's all because there's no insects and there's no har no place for the birds to nest in those. Midwest was a primary incubator for ducks, for martins, for robins, for bluebirds. And to drive along and not see a, a what's that little bug that glows at night, lightning bug. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing when I was a kid, to catch a lightning bug and walk around showing it to everybody. Yeah. No bugs. And then you drive through these fields. When I first started driving through the fields of Iowa and Nebraska in the fall or summer when they're growing, you'd have to stop every 10 miles and take all the bugs off your windshield. Mm -hmm. I drove for a week up there last summer and didn't get a bug on my windshield. Uh -huh. yeah. So yeah, we've gotten rid of the bug, yeah. but we don't realize how important those bugs are to us. Right. They're all part of that system. Yep. And we talk a lot about uh, GMO and that designation and non-GMO, <clears throat> which a lot of, all of our products are uh, designated as non-GMO. What does that mean exactly to a consumer when they see that on a label? And why should they look for it? Why should people care? Okay. In the beginning, the, the place where I grew up and my wife grew up, the main hobby for kids that were in junior high to high school in the, in the spring and summer was to detassel corn. And the reason you detasseled corn is they would plant five rows of brand X corn mm -hmm. that they wanted to combine with another type of corn that they would plant in two rows. Then they would go along with the detasseling machine, and Linda and I would pull the tassels out. Of, that's the male part of the corn. Mm -hmm. So they're basically castrating all these corn plants. So the female part of both this corn plant and this corn plant are still there. But the male's here. So when the wind comes, it dusts the pollen down on there. Now you've got a hybrid seed. Mm -hmm. Because some of these traits and some of these traits. 
Well, that's expensive. You need to do all that stuff in the field. You need to hire people to detassel it. You need to have the farmers involved. So they came up with a technique where they could actually identify the genetic makeup of a cell in a plant, stick a little pipette in there, that's how they did it originally, and suck out the genetic material and put it in the, the cell culture of another corn. And the next thing you know, you had a genetically modified organism, that corn kernel. And what did you want? Well, you wanted glyphosate resistance. You wanted neoticotide mm -hmm. resistance. You wanted uh, the ability to grow faster and have more sugar for the case of ethanol. Um, you, when you got those tremendous, the original corn that I can remember, you might have got 100 bushels of corn per acre. Now they're up to around three or 400 yeah. or something. So that means you have to just saturate that corn kernel with nitrogen and water. And that's a big problem now that if you're putting our precious water to grow corn that's sold for ethanol at 19% moisture, 19% of that's your drinking water you're putting in your car. It just doesn't make any sense. And if you're killing the soil, turning that soil into a potted plant material just to hold the plant up while you put everything else in on it, yeah. that's the danger of GMOs mainly, not the fact that you're going to die from eating GMOs we don't know that yet. It's too early. It's it's probably another 20 years before we know all the side effects of GMO. So, yes, there are animals out there. Like, for example, in Nebraska, we have migratory cranes and, and geese. By the millions, we have geese. They're all eating GMO corn. Mm -hmm. Why don't they die? Well, it's too early. Yeah. Why didn't we die from cigarettes in the 40s right. when they advertised it? <laughs> it took 50 years to get lung cancer. Yeah. So... I think we have to step back and say, yeah, we don't know all the answers, but we do know what worked and what prevents things. Let's take a step back and put your money where your mouth is. If you think you don't want your farmland destroyed, you don't want your water polluted, you don't want your animals mistreated, then buy organic. Right. You don't have to buy Harrison's. You just buy organic. Well, let's, and no, then let's the say farmers you, will respond. you should buy Harrison's, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Organic is another big component of our brand message and of all the products. And uh, that designation is managed by the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture, right? right? So we have to conform with specific standards that they have for organic seed and ingredients in all of our products. Uh, that's important to you and has been from the outset. So what was it that originally turned you on to organic farming? Um, I knew that the that the things that I had learned from 15 years of being an avian veterinarian and going around the world and seeing how birds were fed, there was something missing. I thought it was some secret formula. So we tried monkey biscuits, we tried all kinds of things. But when we got down to something that was truly working, that was John Studley in England. What was John Studley doing different than his friends in, in Ames, Iowa that were raising birds? All of his ingredients in his diet were organic. He would go to the farm and insist on watching how they tilled the soil, how they picked the seeds, how they did all kinds of stuff. So that was one of the first people I'd ever seen put that kind of emphasis on the quality of the ingredients. And then he went after heritage grains. So he mm -hmm. has a corn that was in his mix that I hope we have a very similar one. I, I guess we do because we've done a trial with Mr. Studley before he died for over a year on, on uh, Pyote. Pionis parrots, and he did a side-by-side -side split clutches up, and he found that HBD's product was Harrison's bird food was just as good as his homemade diet that he and his wife spent the whole day making and mm -hmm. growing. So that was very encouraging. And then uh, one of my mentors was David Jones. He says, you know, you need to have something to discern yourself from these big companies. And the mistake they're making is they're not looking at what worked in the past, which is organic. Maybe you ought to take a look at that. So I started looking at it, and I couldn't get any organic ingredients in any quantity. So I finally got a pet or a, a whole, um, an organic food store permit, basically, mm -hmm. and I imported bags of organic corn from a, a f organic food supplier in Florida. And then we didn't know what the heck to do with it. So we ground it up and made it into a, a cake, which turns out to be the precursor to Harrison's. 
power trees. But um, the point was that how are we going to do that in quantity? So right, we went scale? to a yeah. dry extruder up in Minnesota that was a disaster. We went to Kansas State and talked to them. They were doing extrusion. We were working with um, a company in uh, Nebraska that was uh, willing to do a process of extrusion for us. And we worked with them for quite a few years. And um, what we ended up doing was finding a way to mass produce these things that were being made in a bakery before, mm -hmm. which just didn't make it practical at all. And they turned you on, this provider turned you on to David Vetter? Yeah, yeah, the gentleman that was doing this uh, early extrusion. His father had uh, the dream of, his father had retired, but he'd heard about extrusion, so he bought the extrusion machine, and he started, his goal was to produce a way to stabilize foods for, like, Haitians. Mm -hmm. They had food coming in, but within a month it was rotten yeah. or stale or rancid. If you could extrude it, you may have six months, eight months storage, and you didn't have bugs in it and stuff like that. So his concentration was on that. Well, he died, and the family didn't have any way to to make any money. I think they were making a, a product for one of the football game entertainment foods you'd eat at a football mm -hmm. game. That was their only product. So when they heard that we were willing to start doing a bird food, they they were very interested. And and it, they said, you know, if you want really good ingredients, we have a, a gentleman we've worked with on a couple other things named David Vetter. And so we've gone there and uh, gotten involved with David ever since. And uh, it's been a constant eye-opener because there's people David works with. He's the person that put organics in the, on the market. Mm -hmm. He was so convinced that it worked. Not only did he work, do it on his farm and convince teachers around the country to teach organic farming, he went to probably 15 or 20 countries and s helped set up the standards for how do you do organic, what's acceptable, what isn't. So he's like the grandfather of the organic movement. Yeah. And stays away from pesticides, doesn't incorporate any of that sort of right. unnatural elements into his theory and the way he produces. Yeah. Uh, and that has been a bedrock of the brand since the beginning, right? Right. It's interesting. You go back to the, you know, you look at all the technology and the advancements that might make the food more palatable or more stable and you guys ended up back at the original organic you know going back to the very base of the ingredients uh, to come up with the right formula so very interesting so the film dreaming of a better world vetter world dreaming of a vetter world sorry came out in 2018 uh bonnie the director yep. you guys have been in touch with her bonnie hawthorne right right and We've talked about possibly doing a showing, putting something together where we could share this film with the world because uh, it is both educational and I think emotionally impactful. It shows you the struggle of competing against big agriculture and you really feel it uh, when you watch that film and they describe this, the things that David had to go through uh, throughout his life. But uh, you mentioned some of the technology they embrace um, to move things around the farm and some of the technologies that they've pushed up back on. They don't want to be tied to some sort of system that integrates all their uh, all their switches and, and silos and everything that they have to do to move things around so that they're not beholding to some sort of larger technology problem. And that kind of speaks to David's personality that you get from the film. Now, I, I've never met the man personally. I know you guys have a bit of a relationship with them. Um, how, would, how do you feel that film compares to the journey he went on and the actual person that he is today? I think it's really very, very accurate. Uh, the thing that was revolutionary to me was David took the knowledge that his father taught him about farming with him when he went to college, thinking that he was going to become a minister of, of, of a church, which I'm not sure which one it was. And he went to a seminary underneath the direction of a seminarian named Fred Kirscherman. Fred Kirscherman was so impressed with David Vetter as a student, they started doing little projects together. And one of them was to see go out and see David's father's farm and why was it different than the other farms in the area and what Mr. Kirscherman had, had learned. 
he became the dean of or- organic agriculture in the United States. He was the head of the Leopold Center at Iowa State University, a distinguished professor. And he convinced the state of Iowa that, you know, pesticides and fertilizers are doing a good job, but they're causing a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. Let's look at that and see what's going on. So he convinced the Iowa State Legislature to put a tax, I think it was 1% or 2% on fertilizers, GMO seeds, and fertilizers. And that gave enough money for Iowa State University Leopold Center to set up 13 scientists. People started donating farms to the school where they could study organic farming. And they did side-by-side farm this way, farm that way. One was organic, one was traditional, and then one was GMO type stuff. And over and over again, the runoffs that came into the rivers, the quality of the nutrients in the crops, the the use of animals in a humane way, all the things that he did uh, convinced him that Dave Vetter was on the right way. So he's now no longer with the university because they've decided that they're going to go more for big agriculture. Mm -hmm. And he's now the president of the Stone Barns. And I'd love to do an interview with him down the road. Stone Barns is a Rockefeller uh, farm that they grew their own foods. They knew the foods they were eating back in the 40s and 50s might not be the best thing. So they had their own dairy, they had their own vegetable farm, they had their own chefs, all out there at Stone Barns. And they've now picked up doing the research, teaching young farmers how to do organic farming. It's amazing. It's amazing that it still carries on, even though in the face yeah. of big agriculture. Well, the other thing that they've discovered about t- today's agriculture, those machines, I don't have a clue what their gross tonnage is, but it's huge. Mm-hmm. So they have tires wider than this table, but even at that rate, those things going back and forth, back and forth over the farmland, they compact the soil. Mm-hmm. So now there's a new technique that a lot of farmers are doing they stick this thing in the ground and it tells you how compacted the soil is. And it has to be a certain compaction or the roots can't even go through yeah. it. And that's what they've created now is this cement-like farm ground that the mycorrhiza, the worms, and the roots, and that broke all that up and kept it nice and soft. It's, it's gone. All these nuances matter, right? You'd yeah. think we would have learned this with the Dust Bowl back in the 1920s, but <laughs> for well, some the, reason. The Dust Bowl was about monocropping. Yeah. And that was, they had convinced farmers that if they could grow wheat, they, they could survive forever. Well, they didn't realize that there was a problem with wheat, that it had a disease. And next thing you know, the dust bowl hit, which was a drought. Mm-hmm. And there are people that say the corn and the soybeans of today are, are the monocropping. They're all right. the same crop. Is going to create the same thing if we keep it up. And the key in Vetter's estimation on that film was those grasses, that off-season with the grasses, right? That's what helps yeah. repopulate the soil. Nine-year rotation. Yeah. And then most farmers, like my farmer that takes care of my organic farm, I have a heck of a time convincing him to do a nine-year rotation, which means you have to fence it and find somebody that knows how to take care of cattle. Mm-hmm. And it's one thing to say you're a cowboy. It's another thing to move them around and keep them (laughs) alive in the winter. And there aren't many people left in the Midwest that know how to really farm cattle as a ranch rather than in a confinement situation. Mm -hmm. It's funny when I think of GMO and genetic modification. I go back to my uh, Catholic school teaching where they, in chemistry, they teach you about Mendel and the peas and cross pollen, and they call that genetic modification in the 14th century. P- people today don't think of it that way. They think of it as like some sinister, you know, there's a lab somewhere that some giant company has where they're <laughs> cross pollinating these things, which is probably the case today. It's even more simple than that. It's just the pollen has multiple genetic material, and mm-hmm. where they're doing, it's taking a single gene and putting it in another plant and making it a whole different plant. Yeah. But your your example about when you would, uh, what was the term you used for the corn? What did you Hybrid. Do? When, you, when you were. Pollinate. Yeah, you know, the thing you were doing with detassel. tassels. Detassel. That's fascinating to me. And that to me is like, that's how. That was the original how, Mendel. Yeah. That's how this works. And, yeah. and a lot of people think of it as more uh, industrial and sciencey and has to be done in a lab and a 
in a secure area. And it is done that way, Dope. but it can also be done on the field by putting two plants near each other. No, nope, almost nobody does that anymore. Right. That's, but that's how it started, right? I mean, that well, was the original yeah. occurrence of modification. I would modification still separate like the that. two. One was done by farmers and the way they raised the crop. The other is they did go in with a microscope yeah. and a micro tool and transfer genes. And they didn't know what they were doing, whereas creating a hybrid corn plant, it's not going to turn out and grow Brussels sprouts. Right. You know, <laughs> that's what they're trying to do now is come up with something that, like, for example, they came up with a product called golden rice. And what they did was they convinced the plant to produce beta carotene. Mm-hmm. So they took a, I can't remember what they crossed the rice with to, to make it orange, they convinced several countries that this was going to stop children's blindness and right. all kinds of other Vitamin things. Vitamin C, all the things. But the, num- <laughs> but the amount of beta carotene in those rices were so low, it, it never worked. Yeah, that's, that, that's, yeah, reminds me of the uh, Tamaco yeah. episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> Tomato and tobacco. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Harrison, for sharing some of your thoughts with us today here on HBD Chat. Uh, We will, of course, visit with you again in the future. We have a series of uh, other topics that we're going to be discussing uh, with other individuals, both live here in the studio and uh, through the means of uh, this voodoo technology we call Zoom. Uh, We do appreciate your time today. I think uh, we'll be posting routine episodes as we can and have more engaging content for you. You can find them, of course, on our website, on the blog page, or at uh, HBD Media, excuse me, on uh, YouTube as new episodes become available. We encourage you to send in any questions or topics you want to hear about too. Absolutely. We're always looking to hear from either users of our products today who have uh, companion birds or wild birds that they serve uh, or anyone who's just interested in things like avian health or the environment. So you can reach us at chat at harrisonsbirdfoods.com. Send us topics, ideas, guests you'd like to see on the show, or you can connect with us on our social media, Facebook and Instagram.